Good morning. I'm Mark Parkenny, the Senior Manager for Government Initiatives with act -IAC, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar on best practices for management and delivery of DevSecOps, sponsored by Aptio. Today's webinar will feature a panel of August senior leaders, so we hope you will join us for the duration of today's conversation. Just a couple of brief housekeeping notes before we begin. All of the boxes on your screen are resizable. Please feel free to manipulate those boxes to fit your preferences. I'd also like to thank you all to, or, or ask you all to submit your questions using the Q&A box on your screen. Our moderator, Bob Carter, the Vice President of Public Sector at Aptio, will be using them to facilitate the conversation. Finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be made available for review on demand in the coming days. With all that said, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Aptio, once again, and I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity and thank you everyone for joining. I am joined today um, with two great folks, Michelle Dufty from Sonatype. Michelle's the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Sonatype, a Penn State graduate. And uh, we're excited to have you here today, Michelle. And I'm also joined by Mike Howard. Mike is Executive and Chief Technology Officer for Norseman Defense Services. And Mike has been involved in the DevSecOps space for quite some time. So. I'm excited to go over this content. Uh, just to flow for everyone, I would, as Mark pointed out, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box and we'll field them as we go along. We're gonna have an open discussion and forum here. Uh, we'll take you through a number of areas within the DevSecOps arena. Uh, we're finding a lot of lessons learned already. Some of them good uh, as far as productivity and gains with respect to DevSecOps. Uh, on the other side, there's a lot of, I would say, misnomers, terminology, uh, governance issues that folks are trying to wade through and understand as part of this whole new world. So why don't we get started? I'll start through the content and we'll, I'll be engaging with uh, Michelle and Mike as we go through this. So first things first, um, the big thing that we're finding within Sec DevOps is this whole area of code itself, meaning open source is a big part of what we're dealing with, not entirely, but a big part of uh, this whole arena of Sec DevOps. And frankly, about 90% of an application can actually include open source components. And we, meaning the entire planet, is expecting about 1.5 trillion requests for open source components in 2020 this year alone. And as you kind of look at that, there's a lot of open source information and code bases out there and tools the people trying to pull into um, the delivery process with DevSecOps. So I just wanted to start there as this is an inter interesting topic because a lot of folks are trying to get their head around how does open source play? How do we manage that? So I'll start with you, Michelle. What is your take on that aspect of Sec DevOps and, uh, excuse me, DevSecOps and with respect to open source and what, what is your general view on that? Yeah, you know, um, every year we issue a report called the State of the Software Supply Chain where we do some kind of deep analysis of the software supply chain and uh, looking at the demand and supply side of the demand being the developers wanting to consume uh, open source components uh, in their applications so that they can, you know, uh, deliver those applications uh, quicker. And the other side is the supply side. We look at the open source project maintainers themselves and how many open source projects there are and the number of releases that are, are happening every day. And so you could just see that there's just an insatiable demand, as you mentioned, the 1.5 trillion requests for open source components coming from the development side and over 21,000 um, new open source project releases happening every day on the supply side. So, you know, we really see that as, as, organ as you know, agencies are trying to go to DevSecOps and, um, and automate their DevOps pipeline and to get faster when it comes to delivering applications. Um, they know that open source can help them do that. And so it's um, just looking at uh, how you bring that into the software supply chain. You know, um, in the past, you would have to go through procurement and you'd have uh, contracts and uh, you, would, you would know where you're getting your um, software from. But with open source components, uh, developers are going out to the internet and pooling in these components. And so it's just, it's just an interesting um, thing to be aware of as, as agencies look at DevSecOps, this is just a key component of making sure that um, 
that you know what, what is being consumed by the developers and the agencies. Great, understood. And Mike, what is your take on open source when it comes to DevOps? What are you seeing out there? Um, I mean, I look at it from like a holistic point of view, or I guess from end to end. I mean, like open source technology has been in place in the government for several years. I think 15 years ago, we started implementing it more along the sort of mill OSS components with open source and kind of pushed, kind of pushed and led that way forward for the government to make sure that we have uh, more options and have what we call, we had DOD policies written, right? And help advise with those to be in place that you must have some kind of support and reach back, right? So when DevSecOps comes in play, I mean, it's really about streamlining pipeline and taking cloud native applications to the pipeline to push them through to the end to be delivered to get capability of the warfighter off me, right? So open source software though, um, has the issue where there's still a lot of folks without support and having to build in it. So th using things like Nexus repos and so on, you can do the upstream scans of these to make sure there's security checks and the CVEs, and then it goes into repos, and then it pushes into containers and also like their pipelines. I mean, open source is just a matter of just an approach and way of bringing code and pieces together, and then ultimately it's really just a license model between you know from proprietary versus open source, descriptions versus a license. But um, yeah, got it. Okay. I appreciate that. So as we kind of look at this as the sort of DevSecOps, some folks look at it as a continuous workflow, iterative process. Let, let's talk first about this continuous workflow and you know, what is the interaction between some of these different phases? Is it indeed this sort of clockwise view where you work through these different work streams and uh, different teams that is part of the overall development process and how do you communicate and collaborate with these folks and, and bring that together? Because it seems like this is a shift culturally. If I look at how traditional waterfall development had been taking place, now you shift into this world. And it's more of a continuous iterative process. Help me understand, Mike, if you could sort of, what is your view of the continuous nature of this and how do you sort of educate folks on that this is a different paradigm and the cultural side of it all. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, as in general, DevOps is a really a cultural shift, right? Like started an in industry and then starting pushing the government, maybe back, back to like 10 years ago, but it's really streamlining that and bringing development and operations closer so that you can iteratively fix problems and deliver capabilities much faster, right? And then like introducing security, brings in a whole nother one, um, which I think you're going on the next slide, Bob, but um, this iterative approach is to get to the ultimate goal of continuous workflows, right? Um, and then that's where tools come in, which we'll talk through some of that here shortly, of how tools are used to accelerate and to enable that continuous workflow, to enable continuous ATOs, to enable continuous security and monitoring, right? But it's really about shifting an agency to work together more and getting rid of those old, we used to call them like those old stove pipes, right? All that separation. If you imagine these cylinders that are separated and then bringing it together to streamline it. It's been done in industry for years. Um, it's really just helping the government shift to this new approach and then development. Yes, waterfall has always been bad, um, but then agile development, that's just the development process still happens, right? On the development side but applying those methodologies and trying to teach the operation folks of how developers have looked at things iteratively really helps kind of bring it together. Got it. Okay. And Michelle, do you have any comments on this? Is this uh, something that uh, you, you've been keeping a pulse on this workflow and how it all ties together? Yeah, exactly. I mean, when we, when we work with our, our customers, you know, that are, I mean, most of the time, most of the customers we work with are obviously implementing DevOps. And so trying to bring their Dev and Ops teams together from a cultural standpoint is definitely, um, uh, you know, a part of it. Um, I like to always say it's, it's not just about technology. It's a, it is a people and process uh combined solution where um, going through the change management of the people, understanding the new processes, and then of course technology will just help to to um, automate and, and move things along faster. But yes, really understanding the different roles and responsibilities and how they work together and how they can, um, you know, just, 
you know, work more consistently and, and, and iterate faster is, and, you know, speed is really the, the name of the game here. So yes, makes a lot of sense. Okay. And Mike, you've told me that um, agile is not DevOps and DevOps is not agile. Maybe I go to the next slide. We can explore that a little bit more because as you shared this with me in the past, this starts getting into what does this world look like? And maybe you can sort of walk, walk us through the landscape and what, what are we seeing here? Because I keep hearing about this notion of software factories popping up, not only within DOD and um, you know, clearly Platform One, Kessel Run, or some of the more um, prominent names out there, but I, I just see this um, really percolating across Army, now even on the civilian side, they've adopted the term DevSecOps. What, what, what's going on here? Sure, um, so I guess if we go back a few years in the federal world, kind of when they started to realize we need to bring these things together. I mean, security was introduced. It was like a cultural infight, um, but finally everyone in the industry and federal agreed to kind of the term. But what you're really doing is now introducing cybersecurity. So shifting that to the left and putting it in between dev and ops so that we are going to have a mindset of delivering secure code at all times, right? Google and Apple have been doing this for years. Um, folks are, of course, familiar when you get an up iOS update in your phone, right? Right. The recent update is really, they're testing it. They're really testing the end user at the whole time in this iterative approach. It's probably the easiest way to explain of what DevSecOps really is trying to accomplish, right? Is streamlining that whole delivery process. Um, you have multiple buzzwords throughout industry like CICD, you know, like what is that, right? Continuous integration, continuous deployment. That's about pipelines. That's about streamlining the process and software to automate things between it. And again, right, been done for years in industry. Uh, Kubernetes, right? That buzzword, flat enough, not a buzzword, more of a product that Google created and then handed it off to a community called the Cloud Native um, Foundation, right? And then several OEMs have taken, wrapped around that and offered out supported versions of that, which we call Kubernetes platforms. Some folks you've heard in federal call it DevSecOps platforms. Um, kind of, I guess, right? I mean, Kubernetes platforms enable DevSecOps and enable streamlining things and faster accelerated deployment of containers and applications or microservices folks say from time to time, right? Um, then you got test-driven development, which is introducing testing into it or introducing the concept of continuous develop, um, testing. And then CATO, everyone's heard that one. Um, CTO can, can be very complicated. If you can't streamline your agency and bring DevSecOps together or and bring the people together to enable that, right? CTO can't happen. CTO is really applying what we call ongoing authorization, which equals continuous monitoring plus automation. So those two key elements enable that one. Um, MVPs, right? That's the minimal viable product. That's a deliverable iterator approach. And, Industry is always done. Again, reference the iOS phone update. It's an example. Those are MVPs being dumped on you all the time <laughs> to kind of testing the market, right? Quick turn, quick turn, iter, iter. And then Agile, we kind of just talked about a little bit. Um, again, Agile is a development methodology and an approach, right? That I would say almost enables DevSecOps to occur, right? I mean, DevSecOps in the end is a cultural shift to streamline from end to end and bring three type organizations together and you know, definitely it's important to have cybersecurity. Bobby and I chatted the other day, you, the CMMC component, right? that's processes to now apply to contractors to make sure cybersecurity is always thought of as they are delivering DevSecOps, right? Or applications into these pipelines. Um, the graphic here is actually showing an example called Platform One, um, which is now the DOD to go like reference environment. Um, Nick Shalon and his team have done a fantastic job getting this out there and putting it together and bringing DOD together on, on, on at least a common set vision, right? That we all kind of build into with reference architectures. Below that is um, examples of software factories that have been going on. There's one that's kind of highlighted out. I think we'll go into a little bit more detail here shortly, but that's the rogue blue one. And then the other ones, folks on the phone have probably have heard of these in the federal market space. So the software factories are being created to again, help enable right, DevSecOps, to help bring everyone together. And really, if you look at like operations as our endpoint as the warfighter, right, we want to deliver containers or apps as fast as we can possibly get to them. And, and that's what's occurring kind of in the landscape. 
So let, let's explore the culture side a little bit more, uh, if we could. So when, is the, are the software factories necessary? It seems like they're necessary in order to build that culture around what you're describing. It, does one go with the other? I mean, is there, tell me about lessons learned perhaps that is not a good way of doing it. Is software factories the best way where you have that sort of, um, I don't know, all in it together mentality. For example, when I've visited the folks at Kessel Run in Boston, you know, they have this, this startup mentality about them. Uh, the way that they're able to clear and process um, developers in a very short period of time, an unparalleled you know, period of time to get them through security clearance and onboarded. Is that part of the culture too? I mean, what are you seeing out there? I, I think, I would say, yeah, I agree. So um, there's this term, right? Watch language on the recording, but everyone can look up GSD later. That's in the startup community of entrepreneurs, right? Just get things done, right? Um, look out the middle part there. Uh, we want to get things done as fast as possible. And I think, you know, the software factories to me enabled that. It was breaking a mold that's been in place in the federal landscape for years, right? Like just repeats itself. And the software factories broke that mold. It quickly allowed them to shift, to be open, to work more like the Googles and the Facebook and the Apples. And then the next came break in the process, right? And that's where like the platform one side and those components in Cloud One helped push that very, you know, heavily, right? The software factories were an enabler of that. And um, I think they'll continue, right? I can kind of see the landscape happening. Instead of like, you know, Working in this space for 15 years, um, system integrator, for example, you would have their own little contractor site, or have a lab, and then they go into the main lab environment for the Navy or Marine Corps or whatever, and it's really all these procedural lockdowns and a very waterfall approach across the entire culture. And so something had to be done to break it. And the software factories are a lot more flexible to enable that, right? And now we have cloud, of course, and this diagram shows how you can connect to cloud, like a native access point. Like I can personally log into um, Stratcom components right now, right from home over the COVID times on class only, of course, but we can get in and we can do the work for parts of Rogue Blue and software factory components and all these other ones are enabled the exact same way. And uh, the announcement came out over COVID, it was interesting. You know, platform one said, we're gonna go remotely indefinitely, right? So, wow. It's almost like COVID was an enabler too for this to happen, honestly, to kind of make it more efficient. And I mean, developers have been doing this for years, right? All of us, including myself, like coders or whatever, just kind of want to work on our own and just get it done, right? Not all, not all the bureaucrats are kind of just, the bureaucratic of it is kind of pushed to the side, right? Yes, and that's another interesting part. We did have a question come in Top right on the slide, there's the word automation. And Michelle, for wow. you, and I think we have some other slides that are going to get into the automation part of the equation. But you have a lot of this. You have the people, you have the process, you have the tools, you have the governance. How, how do you at Sonatype sort of look at automation, Michelle, and and bring to bear in, in an environment that Mike is uh, showing here with this slide? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the tools that we offer, as, as Mike mentioned, are our Nexus repository, which is a, an artifact repository that, you know, proxies these open source public repositories and brings them in and then manages your binaries and artifacts throughout the, you know, promotes them through various stages of the SDLC, as well as we have more governance tools that looks at the quality and the security of the open source. I mean, all of these tools are, are meant to automate um, processes that, you know, we're very manual in the past, and then I'll probably I'll get into a little bit later. But the key thing with the automation is um, not just that you're 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 getting rid of you know more human steps or hum, you know uh, processes that slow things down, but these tools have to exist in the development environment, in the development pipelines, and tool and the other tools that the developers are, are used to using. Um, and so it you know the. The thing I see about DevSecOps and, and the slide, there's so many terms and there's so many different new types of technologies as listed here, but the key is they all have to kind of work together and they have to, you know, like whenever we build something, we want to make sure it's in the developer's IDE or it's, we're integrating into, you know, a GitHub or, or a Bitbucket or a GitLab pull request so that, again, 
the people working on these technologies and, and are trying to automate, they're not having to you know, learn all these different tools. It should all be integrated and, and, and seamless in their development environment and their DevOps pipeline. And so to me, that, that's the kind of key part of automation and all of this too. Okay. Yeah, Bob, can I, can, I, can I hit that topic too with automation from an end to end approach right. piece? Yeah. Okay, so for like the, also in addition to what Michelle was talking about, right? I kind of break it out even a little larger. So when we mentioned the, like the word automation, like I mentioned it earlier, um, to get to a continuous ATO, for example, or ongoing authorization is automation plus continuous monitoring. What we've seen in the federal market or federal landscape and agencies and customers goes back several years, right? It was always about building these systems, deploying them with a warfighter, applications, whatever, kind of repetitive tasks over and over again and builds and so on and so forth. So that was kind of the first um, components that we started was automating those build lists, right? We want to make sure that with software, right, we can easily do that now. And then in this case, in the DevSecOps world, automation is really that key, uh, Michelle mentioned part of it, and then the, some of it is really attached to the pipeline. So when a developer uploads a container, for example, to your Kubernetes engine, or they're testing it or developing it, right, the next step it needs to go through is security scans, um, needs to check in the repos, uh, map against like EMAS or ACAS or, and then go in and check about certain tests and certain gates it needs to get through, right? And then it needs to be pushed up through to maybe the next enclave, maybe to the next level of security levels, right? Well, all that can be automated. So the goal, the tools around that to enable DevSecOps to bring closer together, what the tools and software products do is actually automation. That's why automation is a very big key to this. Right, I'd say even even one more level, a step further down a little bit, right? Take infrastructure as a service. That's your cloud, AWS, whatever, right? Um, for To one level, there's also platform or service, whatever. But just look at infrastructure. All your virtualization components, right? To get that really up and down, going and scaled, especially for on-prem, 33% of that in order to achieve infrastructure service is all about automation. Right, automating like scalability, building out VMs, databases, backup components, you know, a lot of admin functions, right? I mean, automation is just a very key piece of everything and, and kind of how to achieve it. Okay, so you're, you're saying a third of all that can be automated or are you saying the one third you just described is automated? What is the other two thirds then? I'm probably missing. Uh, part of the um, point I there. guess what I'm saying is in, in order to, so basically like you could walk into a lab environment and they're like, oh, we got virtualization running. Awesome. Right. You, okay. They couldn't use the <laughs> word and say, I now have infrastructure as a service to allow Bob Carter to log in to scale and create a VM. It couldn't happen right. because there's no automation in there. Now, if you apply automation, yeah. which is saying about 33% of infrastructure as a service is automation. So in order to yeah. offer that offering, you have to automate everything behind the scenes. And that's just one example, but enable for us to quickly or to bring the culture together even more is to do a lot of automation on the back end. Right? It's about speed, right? Speed of capability of the warfighter. It's always the key thing that we always have in our brain and our minds. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, right, so it's... let's drill down one level and go into one of the software factories here, Rogue Blue, out of uh, Offit and you know, this, this looks like you, we're going down a level here, and I'll have you join in in a second, Michelle, but I think Mike is hands-on with some of your team at Sonatype and delivering this capability. What, what are we seeing here, and how does this help the folks that are joining this session? And let's break it down a little bit and simplify what we're looking at. And I, I was really intrigued by the far right-hand side. If you do, as you just mentioned, a third is automation as you walk in the door, so you're ahead of the game. You're 33% ahead, if you will, humor me, in that you've mm -hmm. had automation built in as infrastructure as a service to the cloud provider. Now I've got this other two thirds, humor me. And in doing these things in shifting the culture, it looks like you get a lot of huge business benefits on the far right-hand side of clearly increased capabilities and the efficiencies, but you can reduce cost and reduce, reduce labor costs is always interesting because I always find that you want to move people to more high value work, but in reducing labor costs, you can compress that. So help us understand what you're just, you're showing here, Mike, and uh, how it can all come together. 
Sure. So um, we kind of included this this quick screenshot as an executive overview kind of for Rogue Blue Software Battery that myself and team supports. Um, so they've been kind of pushing the edge, right? We started about a year and a half ago. Um, the goal out there was that this is an operational command, right? So, I mean, US Stratcom is an operational command that gets capabilities from three programmer records, for example, that you kind of see on the left-hand side here, where people and systems and everything needs to be put together. And the goal was to speed up that capability to them, to an actual operational command. You have over roughly about 650 developers supporting those programmer records that fold in. And so the goal is not only just like, stripping down an old building and redoing that to make an open culture, right? Like a more Facebook, Google type feel for everyone to come together, to work together with multiple enclaves. But it was also to automate and streamline pipelines um, for software. As those things are put into unclass, they need to go up to secret and then top secret and then deployed across to an operational command. Um, the outputs of that is what you're seeing on the right. Um, increasing capabilities and operational efficiency, right? Reduce IT costs and then reduce the labor costs, right? Again, automate, I'll use the word automation because automation is helping actually reduce the labor costs. And maybe not, it, it's maybe not like removing people in the equation, but maybe having those guys do other things that are needed, right? You can automate a lot of the tasks. And then of course, support the mission owners. In the middle, in the diagram was actually a re-vector I drew of Nick Shalon's uh, reference architecture, just kind of a high level, but that's a reference architecture of what a software factory would look like. It's out of the DevSecOps reference design. Um, so let's kind of plug in the middle to show that Ro Rogue Blue is in line with the, the Air Force and DOD's vision as well and what we've been building towards. And then uh, one Got more it. thing I want to mention because then I want to, for, just for Michelle to hit on, but part of it was um, the Sonatype Nexus uh, repo component that we do use in there, right? Um, but the biggest part is it's for cross-domain solution. It's one of the only things that we had to do that software lifecycle management piece, but currently it's used as cross-domain uh, as a cornerstone technology and maintaining our offline infrastructure and dev environments to keep everything in set. And yes, we have code repos like GitLab um, is utilized and then pushed up to the Iron Bank components or working with you know, pulling down whatever final containers. Um, but in the back end, we needed another component to really manage our offline. This is a disconnected on-prem air-gapped environment and the Nexus repo was one of those tools that kind of fulfills that. Great. So Michelle, do you want to talk to that? Because I started this session off today with open source for a reason that, you know, it really ties into governance. And what Mike just, just described with your Nexus solution is that, you know, that too is, has an element of governance in it. And as you go between the different enclaves uh, and the different networks, you know, help us understand sort of that business problem. and and we will pivot back to more governance here in a moment, but you know, let's get into that now and uh, we can get into the other content as we go further. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly what Mike said is right. I mean, it's, it's used by, um, in, this, in this context to um, be kind of that central source of, of, of information for the open source components that are being downloaded from the, the public repositories um, into these environments. Um, and it, it, and there's a, there's a kind of a governance or security part in front of that, that, that will look and see which components are being downloaded and look at, um, uh, an, an agency's policies to see if, if, you know, they are developers are pulling down components that are, are pre-approved or that can be used, um, within their development environments. And then of course, and then as, instead of always having to go out and proxy and pull from, um, you know, a, a a public repository, it's, it's, it stores a local cache version of that, which obviously speeds up bills, but it also, again, helps with the governance and making sure that um, developers are going, you know, to that, that kind of single source of truth and, uh, and the binaries and all the build artifacts are being um, managed in that one central repository. So again, you know, to, to um, reduce the time it takes for those applications to move along to make sure that that um, they're pulling the most secure and, and um, versions that that meet their policies and that you know um, it reduce you know bandwidth and network uh, latency issues um, as they're moving along the pipelines. Got it. Okay. Now, Mike, we didn't touch touch much on the people. You sort of the little icons you have to the left, but. <laughs> You know, what, what, what was that like in getting, helping them get their head around on, you know, where are you going to help them go and 
what what uh, DevSecOps actually meant, and and I'll ask you as well, Michelle. What is the what are those discussions like? Are they like oh my there's God. no way we're doing this, or what 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 happens? I wish I could turn my screen around right now and show you what's on my monitor because it's like literally <laughs> talking to the developers of Rugly right now live. I mean, it's not that easy, right? We're still doing it today, right? We're a year and a half into this. It, it, part of it is again enabling them, right? You got to get all the tools in. You got to get Kubernetes platform in. You got to get automation in, especially building an on-prem environment, right? Stratcom has no policy or the approvals to use the cloud environment yet, right? We're trying to work on that as well. But bringing the people together, honestly, the developers, the developer part's easy. The developers are like, this is what they do, right? They love it. The hard part is really getting in line with like cybersecurity guys or meeting that cybersecurity person that's been there for 10 years or whatever and being like, well, well what do you mean these guys are going to be involved? Well, you know, I hate to say it, but you know, when we graduate from engineering school, we all know security too. So, right? I mean, we're kind of taught that, you know, bred like that, I would say almost. Um, so streamlined together makes sense. It's really, it can be a little bit of a fight, uh, but it's coming together. It's really just uh, the key piece to us lessons learned was making sure to involve the, engage all the right folks, get the tools up and running to enable everyone to start making that culture shift. Right. And it just starts to come natural. Right. There's nothing that we could force upon them and just kind of just start doing it and everybody would start working together. But yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely not easy at all, Bob. And we still work in a day every day. Like every other program in government. Yes. It, it takes time and education. And this yes. is, um, huge dividends already in a lot of these factories, but clearly the cultural shift is the biggest element as I'm seeing, um, in governance, and again, I had started this off with open source from a governance standpoint, Michelle. And you know, I, I like one of the some of the content you provided to me, and this one was intriguing about open source because I look at a lot of the software you provide, and you just described uh, one aspect of your portfolio with the Nexus solution and doing the scanning and understand one central repository to not only provide efficiencies but a good way to look at uh, the open source information. Help us understand what this means, and I like the phrase, uh, you know, not all open source is created equal. It ages like <laughs> milk, not wine. Which, uh, <laughs> kind, of, kind of disgusting, Michelle, to be honest. But <laughs> I know we've we've been saying that for some time, but it just, I mean, it, what, what we're saying is that, um, you know, just like any software that that's built, there's always an opportunity for you know some potential. Um, uh, security vulnerabilities to be in it or some 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 risk right and so um just this you know mike mentioned continuous monitoring and just always understanding what's being pulled in and what's being used is so important because um you know just like software there's going to be you know potentially security vulnerabilities and we've seen you know one in four organizations experienced um, an open source breach in the last 12 months. I mean, open source, the, the, the interesting thing is the bad actors can have access to open source just like anybody else does. So they know, um, they know when an open source vulnerability is disclosed and they you know, used to wait until a vulnerability was disclosed and then they would go try to find where that component was um, in, in various applications and then try to exploit it. Um, what's interesting, now we're seeing in our latest research um, a 430% year-over-year growth in what we call next-gen um, cyber attacks, where the bad actors aren't waiting any longer for a, you know, a known public disclosure in, like, let's say, the Struts 2 component. Uh, that's a very popular open source component in the Java ecosystem. They're actually going into uh, certain projects, and particularly in the NPM or JavaScript ecosystem, and they're injecting the malicious code in the projects themselves, um, either through something called typo squatting or malicious code injection, or you know what, what's happening is they're they're befriending the project owners, willing to offload some of the work, and they get credentials to the projects, and they go in and they actually uh, modify the code to create the the um, vulnerabilities that they know they can then go exploit later. So it's it's just fascinating to us to the research the way this whole environment is changing. Um, and so when you look at, uh, you know, the NPM and the Java community and so forth, there's just, you know, 
Um, Forty percent of NPM packages rely on code with known vulnerabilities, and one in ten open source component downloads. Uh, that that we see because we're actually the caretakers of of the central repository, which is the public repository for Java. You know, we can see that 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 vulnerable versions exist, and that um, organizations are still requesting those vulnerable versions. And so, what to, to us, it's just super clear that or you know, agencies, organizations are aware that these exist in their in their applications, um, and they have visibility because a lot of times the, the key word is visibility. They don't necessarily know what's being pulled in. They don't know if they're vulnerable, um, and they may have these manual processes um, up front to try to block them when they, you know, before they even download. But when we say it ages like milk, not wine, what we mean though is, you know, a developer could download an open source component today that is free of vulnerabilities, but then, you know, a month from now, something's disclosed. And so you always have to be continuously monitoring and aware and the visibility um, into what's in your applications through a software bill of materials and so forth to have, you know, when something is disclosed, that uh, you know where it is, uh, and if it's, you know, if it's if it's accessible by someone on the outside, if or if it's an internal application, you know, that context to these where these open source components live and and the severity of of any security risk is really important that 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 people are aware of. Got it. It sounds like you're not opposed to open source. It's just, again, it has to be managed and governed correctly. And your tools and offerings address that from an automation perspective. And if I take Absolutely. it a step further here, it looks like you also address um, the governance side of, you know, don't do it manually because you can't keep up and it won't scale, but there also seems to be a legal side uh, to the issue too. Can, can yeah. you help me understand what this represents? Yeah, no, I mean, we, you know, I, I mean, as the, as the owners of the, of the central repository for Java, we are a hundred percent, you know, a part of the open source community. So it's, it's not that um, we, we, we hundred percent believe in the value that it provides. I mean, why create a logging framework from scratch when there's hundreds out there that you can go use and, and, and focus your time on building the logic that's going to, you know, make a difference to your, to your mission or to your agency. Right. So, um, you're exactly right. It's it's we 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 know uh, developers use open source and we want them to, but but they they have to have they have to understand how to manage it, just like any other thing. It's not you know it's free, but it does it's not free in terms of you know getting control over and and, and managing it. And so, you know, again, what we've seen is many times there are manual processes in place where before a developer can use an open source component, they have to go to a compliance review board. And that review board has like given a, you know, a, a white list of all the components they can use and, a, and another list that says, these are all the components you can't use. Um, and what happens is, is that just slows down development, right? That the whole point of DevSecOps and automation and everything on Mike's previous slide is to go faster with automation. And so if you want to get a control on open source components, you have to automate this, and 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 if you if you create these silos of, of of these teams that are with these manual processes, where you need manual review and and um, uh, approval, or securities out there manually trying to identify which components are good or bad, or they see a disclosure and they need to understand, well, are we using that or not? Where do I start to triage and identify the risk? Or the ops teams don't have a way to monitor uh, risk in production through continuous monitoring. Or legal teams, again, you know, we talk about open source, the security risk, but you know, as you just mentioned, there's legal risk too. Um, you know, developers bring in open source components and don't understand the legal um, licenses tied to those those uh, components. So a lot of times they have to go to legal and get review, or get approval before they can use something. So when you have these siloed, um, you know, uh, information siloed teams that are doing manual processes. That is not DevSecOps. That's not in the spirit of automation and moving quickly. And so that they just they 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 won't scale. These type of processes won't scale. Got it. And this next, I probably am teeing this up for you, but it feels like, you know, what you bring to bear is the you know the automation of what we just talked about, and um, maybe you can put a bow on it and and tell me what we are talking about with this this content, because yeah. as I hear both you and Mike talk. You know, there's a lot to this. This is the moving parts of actually developing the code and the underlying tools and technology, the governance, which you're 
covering here, and then um, the legal side a little bit. How, how, what does this mean? What, what does this automated governance process mean to you? Yeah, so exactly. I mean, what, what our tools are meant to do is to provide developers with that insight into the open source components they're using and give them, you know, uh, information about the legal risk, about the security risk. Um, we allow customers to define their open source policies in the tool, and then the tool is looking and scanning um, at the develop the developer's code, or looking in the when the developers are in the IDE and they're selecting a component, uh, you know, and automatically they start to see is this component they're they're wanting to use um, in violation of a policy or not, and so. You know, we talk a lot about shifting security left, and, and that's exactly what we're trying to do is provide all of this rich intelligence that we know about open source components from a security and legal and uh, quality perspective, giving that to the developers very early on in the DevOps pipeline um, so that they can automate, that they don't have to wait for security approval. If they try to pick something and it, it has a CVS score of nine and it violates a policy because it's illegal, a license they're not allowed to use, they'll be told immediately in their IDE. They don't have to go to security and ask for approval. They don't have to go to a, a golden repo of approved components. They can, they can they can move quickly, download what they want, but know that, that um, they're using it within the confines of what they're allowed to do. Another thing we like to say is um, guardrails, not gates. You know, in the old waterfall, it was, you know, gates. You had to get to this gate and get approval and go to the next gate. Our solutions are 100% built to automate uh, go governance so that, that um, it's, it's guardrails. So as developers are developing, security feels confident that they have the information they need to make the right decisions from a security perspective. As Mike mentioned, developers know about security. You know, they, they know what they need to do, but with open source components and, and, and you know, there's just so much, the data is constantly changing. So the intelligence is so important that they had the information they needed their finger fingertips and as I mentioned before, in the tools that they're already using, um, so so that that's the key is that you have to automate this. It has to be embedded in their IDEs or in their GitHub pull requests, um, and security has to have visibility into when you know what they're using and where it's located. And ops teams need to be able to create a software bill of materials and know what's in production. But this has to be it has to be automated. It can't be it just can't be manual processes anymore. When you're looking at DevSecOps. Got it. So, so Mike, does this notion of guardrails versus gates resonate with you and do the guardrails help with the cultural side as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like to let Michelle explain that. So, but yeah, it's like driving down the highway, right? the guardrails are to kind of keep you in some lane, right? And then the gates are like to get you through the next level, right? Or like, um, that's where like, we talked about automation earlier. That's what automation is doing, right? It's setting the some lanes for developers. Like if I, painted the picture of delivering a container to AWS, a cloud, and to get to the warfighter. It's going to be put in, and then it's pushed through a series of steps, right? Past the certain gates until it's released out to the warfighter. Um, but yeah, and governance is very, very key here, right? It's like there's so many aspects of governance, but like configuration management, right? Like mont managing all those tools down to the devices, like where are they, whatever, right? We all deal with that every day at work. Um, code repositories, management, application management, security governance. You got AppTIO, for example, cost governance, right? Like what's a, what's a, what's a program manager looking for across this entire thing, right? That's all that whole governance layer, right? I think AppTIO is like one of the tools that helps manage that component of that layer piece of it, right? Verifications and audits, right? Government's got CCRI checks every quarter, right? Security audits. It's all governance components that are kind of, that are there. Yeah, it's interesting. When you and I were talking, um, when we talk about the financial side of the equation, and, and my company, Aptio, has been doing IT financial management for 12, 13 years now, and we use an underlying standard called TBM, Technology Business Management, and I would submit that DevSecOps is not immune to um, understanding the cost of everything that we've been talking about here. But you put this into the governance side of things because you felt that um, innovation and creating those uh, minimum viable products and the ongoing ops and maintenance is really governance and you need to understand the financial side of the equation to this too. 
And, and what are you seeing uh, on that front? You, you keep putting it into governance when we were talking, which I agree with. When the, in this whole world, we're trying to help with all this going on and everything the two of you have talked about, the culture, uh, the tools, the security, uh, the governance. And now what we're trying to layer into the governance level or layer is how do you align the portfolio to the plans as you capture and prioritize and align the demand to the portfolio strategy. So that's another level that we're talking to. And I always like to say, are your resources aligned to your mission goals? So you're doing all this work and how do you actually look at this from a financial perspective and align that into the overall strategy as well? So a lot of folks from our side are trying to figure out how do I plan, forecast, track the work, understand the cost of delivering products across those portfolios. And much like you two are saying, how do you communicate through the cultural side of DevSecOps? And if you're delivering a new feature capability and you're going to deliver it to the different stakeholders, what does it cost to do that? So between the three of us, frankly, there's the automation of technology through Sonatype. Mike, it's the, your great work of understanding DevSecOps from a culture and what you need to bring it to bear to maximize the efficiencies. And I think where we play is the governance side of understanding product road mapping and showing delivery against those plans and tracking those resources that are being utilized to create the different code bases. So I don't know if you guys are getting into my side of the world at all and you're seeing this as your overall sort of uh, view of the world, but we're really focused on the resource capacity planning the cost of delivering DevSecOps. And I would just ask, how does that fit into some of the discussions uh, you're working in, Michelle, and, and what are you seeing on that front, if at all? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I mean, we are a technology company, um, and, but, you know, we have a, a, a customer success team that is, you know, trying to make sure that uh, our, our tools are delivered and adopted. Um, and so understanding, you know, the, the cost of bringing these tools in and, and how that's going to help them deliver on their roadmap um, it is really important. And the other thing we say a lot is, you know, what are what are our customers like the tools themselves are not hard to learn. Um, it is the cultural thing. And so what we focus on is what are our customers desired income outcomes and a lot, and there's a lot of outcomes and some are financial and some are, you know, about getting um, to delivery faster. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the key part is that yes, there's the technology part, which is not hard to learn, but the cultural silos and understanding the overall cost to the organization for bringing this in on. And, you know, many of our customers ask us what the return on the investment is, right? If I buy this technology, what, what am I going to get back? And so, you know, understanding that from a financial model perspective is really important. And Mike, are you seeing anything in this area or are you really focused on the culture and bringing the DevSecOps to, to life within a lot of these organizations? Around the financial aspect of it? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I guess I deal with that too daily to a sense, but it's more looking at things about, you know, what's the cost versus what platform would we use, right? It's like the technology capabilities and versus the cost components. Um, from a delivery aspect, I mean, we're constantly watching it. I am seeing it from a gun perspective. You know, I do know that Stratcom on the operational side is using like your tool, Bob, um, to manage some of the cost components, but that's from the system integrator structure, which is great, right? I mean, everybody cares about the, the money in the end. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're seeing it and the shifts how things done. I mean, I don't want to get into like that agile discussion, but a lot of us also believe that like the agile methodologies, we don't really need them. Right. We just, just get things done. Right. Just code, 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 go deliver, code, 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 deliver, like quick, 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 but you still want to keep track. We keep track of our teams, right? Like how much is being delivered? How much is it costing us? What's the tail on it? Right. And that bottom line, it's really what the end government's looking at. And, so yeah, I mean, it's a pretty big component. I, I'd put it like at the governance layer across everything. Got it. We had a question come in about lessons learned. Do you uh, want to share what to do, what not to do, M Michelle? What are some of the things that you've seen is like, man, that's a really bad idea. Never do that. 
or maybe one or two best practices that you're seeing out there? Yeah, I think what we see with our tools is, um, you know, a lot of times we'll see that our, our solutions purchased by the security teams um, because they want to get a hold on what open source components are they using. I don't want them to use anything that could put us at risk. Um, and the biggest lesson learned is that's okay if they make the purchasing decision, but if they don't bring the dev or DevOps teams along with them, um, they just don't see the same value as if, you know, if you roll it out to the development and the, the DevOps teams. It, um, the best practice is, is even in siloed um, areas, you know, uh, if, 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 if it's purchased by one area, you have to bring the developers along because if the developers don't adopt it and security just uses some of these tools as a as a scan and a gate function again not guard they don't look at it as guardrails they look at it as gates and they just do a scan and they and they say hey you use this component you shouldn't have i'm going to throw this report back over the wall and hope that you fix it that's not at all the purpose of of automating and moving fast and devsecops so um, I think it's again, it's just back to that cultural mindset that that you know they security has to look at these tools as guardrails to developers, give them the information they need in the tools they need. Um, and yes, there's a lot of value for security teams as well, but you have to bring the dev and DevOps tool, tooling teams along uh, if you really want to see that the success and to really meet their desired outcomes. Interesting. Thank you. Mike, lessons learned from your side on you know, what to do, what not to do? <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> it really just comes down to like technology pieces and how you do it. And, uh, you know, our approach is always to, we're a little bit different, right? Our, our approach is always to use what I call expertise on demand, right? Like we want to use the experts in our fields and get it done as fast as possible, right? The, the legacy way of doing things with what we used to call like butts and seats, it's kind of like a dying model. So like my company, for example, what I'm built and doing is around DevSecOps, but it's really about using those experts, right? Not necessarily be my guys, but we just get it done quick, fast. Um, that was kind of one area I've seen, right? It works and we've proved it. Um, the other one would be um, the biggest one I think is really working with the government and stakeholders, all right? The, I would upfront have that common envision done, um, the requirements laid out, right? Defined clearly uh, and then start to bring the others in after we've kind of put it all in place. Because I think some of the struggles I've seen is engaging everyone too fast, right? It's in any thing in life, but engaging everyone too fast, you're getting all this input and all these ideas and visions and people's opinions, right? And you can't get anything done, right? Completely defeats the purpose of the DevSecOps. Um, that's probably the biggest lesson learned I would give, especially when trying to do a culture shift, right? kind of engage people as needed and then release. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, thank you. Well, Mark, I'm gonna wrap up with a couple final comments and turn it back over to you. So I wanna thank both Michelle, uh, Michelle Dufty, who's the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Sonatype, and Mike Howard, who's the CTO and Executive Norseman Defense Services for their time today. I would ask everyone that attended today, these are very, um, really sophisticated folks when it comes to DevSecOps. They can add a lot of value to your uh, journey and you know their information would be available to you if you choose to reach out to them. Uh, super busy folks and I'm really thankful they were able to carve out time today and the time prior to today to prepare for today's session. So Mark, uh, on that note, Aptio has been uh, very thankful once again for allowing you to have a sponsor today's event. Uh, we, Aptio, really focus on the financial side of the uh, DevSecOps side of the equation to understand what is the cost of doing all this to make sure that you are delivering those resources against the mission goals, and that is our focus. So, Mark, thank you again, and uh, I'll turn it back to you and ACT-IAC. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob, and thanks, Michelle and Mike, for the robust conversation, and thanks to Aptio for sponsoring today's event. A friendly reminder that this webinar will be available on demand for review later this afternoon. Please stay tuned to ACT-IAC for more virtual activities in the coming weeks. Thanks again for joining.